In this lesson, we will discuss about the different phases of static malware analysis. As we already know, static analysis is a technique of analyzing a sample file without executing it. This method involves extraction of useful information from the suspected binary which can help us make informed decisions on how to classify the malware, how to analyze it and where to focus our subsequent analysis efforts. As a first step, we do a antivirus scan. If the antivirus detects the sample as malware, then we don't need to do any further analysis as all the information about the malware will be available in the vendor portal. However, it is worth noting that this scan has to be performed with all the features in the antivirus enabled, something called as deep scan. If the antivirus doesn't detect the sample as a malware, as a second step, we will see if any other vendor will detect this as a malware. That is, we might be using semantic in our company and the company might not have the signature to detect this specific malware. So we will see if any other vendor like McAfee or Trend Micro or Kaspersky can detect this sample as malware. Now, does this mean that we need to purchase all these antiviruses? No. There is a web-based tool called as VirusTotal. This tool is run and managed by Google and is free to be used by anyone. It can be accessed at www.virustotal.com. How to use this tool? Should we submit the file sample directly to VirusTotal? There is a risk in doing so. Remember, the file is a suspicious file, but it is not yet proven to be a malware. What if this file is a clean file and holds some sensitive information about your company? If you upload it to VirusTotal, everyone in VirusTotal community can see the file. So, it is never a good idea to submit the file itself. Then how do we do it? We submit the file hash. Every file has a unique fingerprint called as file hash. So how do we get the file hash? We have a tool called as hash calc, short for hash calculator, to calculate the hash values using different algorithms. In this image, we have submitted a file sample called as track01.mp3 and hash calc has calculated various hashes for us like md5, sha1, etc. It is important to follow the best practices to evaluate if using virus total is the right for the scenario. One has to realize that the details of all the submitted files are stored and accessible to all virus total community users. So never submit the actual file, instead use the file hash. There is a risk involved in submitting the hash too, which is the attacker might also subscribe to VirusTotal community and keeps checking if anyone submits the hash of the malware he has written. In a targeted advanced persistent threat, this might force him to trigger other methods or use other attack vectors. Next step is we need to understand the actual file type. Attackers use different techniques to hide their file by modifying the extension, changing the icon, etc. This is done in order to trick the users to execute it. So it becomes necessary to determine the actual file type of the suspected malware. Knowing the file type will help in identifying the malware's target operating system. That is, whether it is targeting Windows or Linux or Mac operating systems and also the architectures like 32-bit or 62-bit OS. File types can be identified by the magic number. Remember the DOS header in the PE file format? Magic number is a number embedded at the beginning of a file that indicates its file format. It is also referred to as file signature. Though magic numbers are not visible to users, there are specialized tools called as 
hex editors to see the magic number. One such tool is hxd. As shown in the image, when a file is loaded onto hxd, the very first few bytes indicates the file type. In this case, it is ffd8ffe0, which denote a JPEG file. The list of all file signatures are recorded in the Wikipedia. A link to the same is provided in the resource section of this lesson. There is an alternate tool to detect the file type of a sample called exe-info-pe. This is a graphical tool that tells if a file is executable or not. Next, we need to check for packers. To refresh the concept, packers are used to compress binary files. Malware authors use the packers to obfuscate their malware. Examples of packers include UPX, EXE Stealth and PE Spin. When a binary is packed, the number of readable strings in the sample are reduced, thereby making the process of malware analysis complex. So it is essential to unpack a sample before analyzing it. EXE Info PE which was used to learn about the file format will also help in checking if a file is packed. It also gives unpacking instructions. In the image, we have loaded the exe info pe.exe and the tool says it is packed with upx. Down below, it also gives us hints on unpacking the file. In this case, we can use the tool upx.exe with an argument of dash d. Next important step in static malware analysis is string analysis. It is a process of extracting readable characters and words from the malware. Strings will help us in understanding the functionality of a malware. It does so by giving us information like the list of libraries and functions used in the malware, any message that the program is trying to print on the screen, like error messages, pop-ups, etc. File names and file path it is creating or accessing or modifying. URLs and IPs present. Typically, malwares connected to a domain or an IP address, uh, which is called as command and control, through which the malware author controls the malware. And string analysis also give us registry keys. The key is being created, deleted or modified. Care has to be exercised while doing string analysis because attacker might include fake string to misguide the analysis. There are two widely used tools for string analysis. One is a sysinternal tool from Microsoft called Strings. It is a command line tool. The other one is bin text. It works exactly like strings but has a graphical user interface. Next phase of analysis is to look into the details of PE file. We have already learned few things about PE file structure. Let's use the knowledge in understanding the malicious indicators in the PE file. First, we will look at time date stamp. This is a date and time when the file was built or compiled. This is usually set during the compilation process, but it can easily be modified by some specialized tools. If the value is older than 1992 or set to a future date like 2022, it would possibly be a malware file. Next, we will look into the number of sections field. Most non-malicious PE file use small number of sections, usually between 1 to 6. If there are more number of sections, like more than 10, it could possibly be a malware. We should also focus on the characteristics or permissions of the sections. Usually, the .text section that contains the executable code should never have write permissions. However, malware authors keep changing the .text section in order to morph the malware in order to avoid detection. Write permission on a .txt section is an indicator of a malicious file. 
Next important section we look into is the resources section denoted by dot .rsrc. As discussed in earlier modules, this section holds the supporting images, fonts, icons, strings, etc. A malware could use the resource section to store configuration data and code that assists in malicious functionality. Another aspect of resources is the language attribute which will help us in understanding if the malware is targeting a specific country based on language like Russian, Chinese, Arabic, etc. In some rare cases, it could help to attribute the source of malware that is identify who is behind the malware. But malware authors deliberately include different language to misguide the analysis. Next, we will look at the size of the resource section. Usually, the size of the resource section will be less compared to the overall file size, like less than 25% compared to the overall file size. That is, if the full file size is 1 MB, the resources could be around 250 to 300 KB. Anything more than 30% could mean it is malicious. This is because malware authors have a practice of using resources section as a storage place for additional execution code. In some cases, an entirely new PE32 file is stored within a resources section only to be dropped onto a system post-infection. We should also consider the entropy of the whole file and entropy of each section. Entropy is the measurement of randomness. More randomness means higher entropy value. If the entropy is high, then it could mean that the binary is encrypted, which is an obfuscation technique used by malware authors. The tool that will help us to dissect and understand the PE file structure is PE Studio. In fact, this one tool can help us understand various aspects of the file sample including strings, libraries and functions, magic number, etc. In the next lesson, we will take a look at demonstrations of all the tools discussed here.